Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter of HurricaneTrack.com here. It is the 10th day of August 2021, and we are talking about PTC6 here, Potential Tropical Cyclone Number 6. Real quick, in case you didn't know what that meant, this was created a few years ago to make it easier to deal with these systems that are on the verge of becoming a tropical cyclone that is a depression or a storm, and it gives the National Hurricane Center the ability to issue watches and warnings, coordinate with local governments of the various nations of the Atlantic Basin to do that, and it helps to speed that process up when you have a system that's really close to becoming a tropical depression or stronger. It kind of fills in that gap. I know it's a weird thing. It's kind of those three potential tropical cyclone and the three letters there, PTC or whatever, but that's the solution to that problem for these sort of either short fuse systems that are close to the coast or a system that is approaching land at some point and does have potential for further strengthening. It kind of helps to, you know, give emergency managers and planners and the media, you know, better uh, tools to work with, that kind of thing. And uh, another item of, of note, if this was just going to be out in the Atlantic somewhere and not going to bother anybody, it wouldn't get this designation. This is only when it would potentially threaten land with impacts that it would get this designation. So it's kind of between the invest, what we call 94L in this case, this is what it was, between that and a depression or a name storm is PTC. So there you go. So what is it up to? What's going on with it? Well, let's take a look. Satellite imagery from Tropical Tidbits. There's the system right there. Fairly well developed, a very sharp curved band much more banded looking than it was yesterday, less of that sort of blobular, and that is a, a, a word now, add it to the Webster Dictionary. It's less blobby <laughs> and more curved band and banding, and that's important because it is trying to organize. It is still struggling against a marginal background state. Everything throughout this region is is getting there. The pot is simmering, so to speak, but it's not ready just yet. And so that's why <clears throat> this hasn't taken off, which is fine. We don't want it to do so, but that explains it. The background state, there's still some dry air, and the overall upward motion pattern isn't quite ready yet. It's close. And so is this system to becoming a tropical storm, probably. And when it does, assuming it does, it will be Fred. We also have this area to watch, which might try to develop a little bit more as it heads off to the west and west-northwest with time. And then in the eastern Pacific, you see this one system south of Mexico. Kevin is up here off the screen. None of these are going to have any direct impacts to Mexico, the Baja Peninsula, or Hawaii. So we won't even worry about the eastern Pacific right now. Here's a nice look at the vorticity signature associated with soon-to-be Fred right here. Nice and round overall. Bundling the energy. That's what that looks like when it does so. It's not diffuse and elongated like this. This is along an old trough or a frontal boundary up here in the North Atlantic. It's more focused, and that's what we look for. That is the fingerprint of a developing tropical system. And the more of these brighter colors that you see, that'll indicate strengthening vorticity, the air spinning faster, an increase in what we call the conservation of angular momentum. And here's another good way to think of it. When you see the brighter colors up towards the top of the scale, there those white colors, that's very similar to when a skater pulls in their arms and they spin faster. And when they release that energy, they slow down. It's really neat, and it works in the tropics too. Uh, and with any kind of a cyclone on this planet, and the tighter that gradient is, the more it spins, the more vorticity there is, then you get the wind, and, and as such, a strong tropical system, potentially. All right, so close up of it. It's really starting to get there still not quite. You know what I mean? It's like a very sharp wave axis in here, something like that. Uh, Mid-level rotation, probably evident, but at the low levels, Recon was down there flying around, probably still is, and they are looking for evidence of a west or southwest wind in here. You got to have it in all the quadrants. Doesn't count if it's just a sharp wave axis in here. It's got to be 360 degrees, rotary circulation, and it's almost there. Uh, and that's just for the designation of what we humans name this thing. It doesn't matter what we call it. It's a huge weather feature 
relative to all of us. It's bigger than any of these islands, right? So it's moving in. It's got the strong rain bands and uh, this little core trying to develop in here. Much more banded than it was yesterday for sure. All of that blowing through the islands. I'll show you some cams in just a minute. We have three of them down there. Hopefully they're running. Power outages are easy to come by, unfortunately, in the Virgin Islands in Puerto Rico. It's just the way it goes. A couple of things to note. Upper level anticyclone above it. So the outflow is fairly well established. There's just some dry air in the mid-level sitting over here, kind of hampering development. And it's just not perfect conditions. Again, and that's good. We're not, we're not rooting for this to develop and, and destroy lives. We're looking at it from an analytical perspective. What does it take to ramp one of these up? And it's just not quite there yet. A couple of other interesting things. Look at all the lightning, especially earlier in this very large band to the east of the island still. All of this weather will be moving through, bringing the Lesser Antilles, squally weather, gusty winds from time to time, and the potential for very heavy rainfall, which can go down and fill up these little streams or gullies or guts, whatever you call them down there, depending on your locale. Yeah, you get flash flooding, similar to the dry arroyos in the desert southwest, you know, where there's drought conditions. Well, it's not a drought down in the Caribbean. Everything's green and luscious. And is that a, right? Luscious or lush? Maybe luscious is when, whatever. You get the idea. Close, but I, I blew that one. But it's lush, lush vegetation. And you get all that rainfall, though, and it does focus. Again, gravity starts to become your enemy there because that rain falls into these valleys and these little streams. And they may be dry, relatively speaking. Not dry like the arroyos out west, but dry enough. And then when you get all that rainfall, you get flash flooding. And that can cut through roadways and driveways and whatever. And that can be a real big problem. So that is an impact, all right? It doesn't have to be a big old 100 mile an hour plus hurricane to cause problems. Going to focus on that each and every time because I think people lose sight. Well, if it's not strong, I'm not going to pay attention to it. All right, well, do so at your own peril. Looking at the radar, really neat tool here from Mark Nissenbaum over at Florida State University. I love that he puts these together. Uh, I'll put the link to this in today's video description. And you can go in and make it, you know, 130 frames or more if you want to. My uh, AT&T Gigafiber will hopefully load these up nice and quick. Look at that long animation. Boy, really good job there. <laughs> Applause for uh, Mark Nissenbaum at Florida State for making this available. You can really see those rain bands coming in through the Virgin Islands now into Puerto Rico. And there's quite a few mountains hillsides, whatever, in Puerto Rico. I've been there briefly when Dorian was approaching, so I have seen it with my own two eyes, as they say. And uh, yeah, that rainfall going to cause some flooding here. I bet it won't be long that we start seeing some flash flood warnings coming out of National Weather Service San Juan. A little bit of a dry slot for most of the Virgin Islands for now, but more rain coming in as this system moves through, moving at about 15 miles per hour. So on that note, that's different from Elsa. Remember, Elsa was just hauling butt through the Caribbean at more than 25 miles per hour. That was in early July. The trade winds were screaming through there, the big pressure gradient. That is to say, the difference in pressure over distance, the gradient. And when that gradient is tight because of various factors, the wind blows stronger. A stronger high pressure area to the north over the North Atlantic generates very strong trade winds earlier in the summer that has started to relax. The high is weakening, it's moving more north, and so the trades are relaxing, and so these systems kind of come through at that optimal speed of anywhere from 10 to 15, maybe on the high end of things, 20 miles per hour, anything faster than 20, and it starts getting difficult for it to bundle. This is sitting right at about 15 miles per hour forward motion, and so that's interesting, okay? Yeah, this is something to definitely pay attention to. All right, so looking at things real quick, this is from St. John. Brent, our good uh, supporter, friend, colleague, uh, does a lot of our graphics, too, when we have the post-tropical cyclone reports that we put together. He makes those for us. He's developed some camera systems. Just an, He's like MacGyver. He really is. Not just a Patreon crowd funder, but a contributor of all things innovative. Well, this is the camera from uh, near Cruz Bay in St. John and the Virgin Islands. And I said there was a dry slot, and I proved it to you. There you go. 
Uh, Brent set up a camera down here somewhere, a GoPro, recording the rainfall down in one of those guts, as they call it. It's kind of like a little stream bed that's yeah, normally dry, if you will. We'll see what that captures. Moving on to the west, hopefully this is working. It was out earlier. Might have seen it on the Weather Channel. They were showing it earlier today. This is down at St. Thomas, facing northward. And the other camera I just showed you is generally facing south. And a little bit of wave action coming in there, kind of dry right now in between those rain bands. So that's good for now anyway. And then over in San Juan at Carlos, uh, his place. The other one, by the way, St. Thomas. Another one of our patrons, Timothy Olive. This is Carlos over in San Juan. This is facing north out of his apartment. And a little bit of rain on the lens there, traffic going by. Really going to be interesting to see what happens if they get a lot of rainfall there. Puerto Rico, susceptible to the flooding. So what a world. We can just... I know that there's Earth Cam and lots of webcams out there. There's millions of them. But we have our own growing network. Really nice to be able to do so through our crowdfunding project. So that's just a look at what's happening down there. I often say open up the window and see what's going on. That's the radar. That was the real world. All right. So let's talk about the future of this. Um, and I'm going to just tell you right now, I have no models, no GFS, no Euro, no HWARF. Why? They're not going to be very good right now. We don't have a formed vortex just yet. It's close. We don't have a discernible feature for this to really lock in on, this being numerical weather prediction. All right? So I'm not going to worry about trying to sift through all the different models, the Canadian, the Euro, the UK Met, the Icon, the GFS, the you know Bob's model, whatever. And if there's any Bob's watching, no offense to you. You might have a great model, who knows. Um, seriously, let's just look at this from the bigger picture. What is most likely to happen with the large-scale features that we see in front of us? And that's, a, that's the best way to approach it, in my opinion. So starting with that, Let's look at the sea surface temperature anomalies. We know that the water out here is warm. It's warmer than 80 degrees. And so that's set. That part is set. That's one puzzle piece. Well, in most of the area where PTC6, soon to be Fred, is tracking, water temperatures are right at or slightly warmer than average. But if you go northwest of there into the Bahamas and beyond, those water temperatures are a little bit warmer than average. Bottom line is, there's no cold anomalies through here. So the background state of the energy available, the water temperatures, are right where you need them to be. It may be slightly elevated. So that's one positive for this to strengthen. All right, That's one aspect of it. The next thing is the MJO, the Madden-Julian Oscillation. A complex phenomenon to try to describe to people, but very useful to understand what the potential ceiling here is for development. Now, this is what we call the phase diagram chart, and it shows us what the MJO is doing, has done, and is forecast to do. This is the past all through here. This is where the MJO has tracked around the globe. It's generally moving from west to east. Every 30, 45, 60 days, this interesting phenomenon, mainly down in the tropics. I mean, it's almost exclusively the tropics. And so this is the past all through here. This is where it is now. This is the future from the GFS. It's ensemble. I think that's the mean, if you will. And these are all the different various ensemble runs. And then the envelope gives you about you know, roughly 90% confidence of where it should be, something like that. The envelope, almost like the cone, if you will. So what does this mean? What does the MJO even mean? Well, think of it as a very large umbrella of favorability that just kind of moves across the globe. It is most efficient in creating upward motion, tropical thunderstorms, deep convection, and tropical cyclones. It does its best work at that in the western and generally the eastern Pacific. Very prominent in the western Pacific. When this sets up over the West Pack, you usually get some pretty big-time typhoons. As it moves eastward out of the Pacific and spills into the Atlantic, it definitely has an influence, but it's not quite as robust, usually, from what it ends up doing than what it does in the Pacific. So what we're seeing here, going forward, this favorability window, it's right in here, and this favors phase one, where it is now, amplifying into phase two, 
and then going through that into phase three. These areas through here favors upward motion and the fostering of tropical cyclone development and health and strength in the western hemisphere, usually close to the southwest Atlantic. And then it moves on through, getting into the Indian Ocean area, over Africa and vicinity, and that helps to spawn more tropical waves, more energy that comes off of Africa for more seedlings going forward. So we're amplifying, getting more favorable as we go forward over the next few days. That's what all of this shows. So soon to be Fred will be moving into a pattern that is generally more favorable. This is the GFS and its ensemble forecast system. This is what the Euro shows. A very similar thing, which is not often that you see them agree like this. This is where we are now. This is where we're headed. And you see it also favors one, two, and three, the phases one, two, and three. And we know historically, take my word for it, going back in time, that the most tropical cyclone activity will happen during those phases. It can happen outside of those phases, but this is very favorable, and this is amplifying. It's not leaving. We're not coming out of a favorable phase. It's not in the null phase, as we call it, where there's no discernible MJO activity. This is a boost, a large-scale boost, that is going to be coinciding with the passage of soon to be Fred. That's what I'll call it. All right? So that's very important. This is what it looks like. And I want to credit this real quick where I got this. This is from a very nice blog from Jake Karstens, meteorologist and PhD candidate. I will also link this for you in the description of today's video. So this is where I'm lifting these graphics from. Definitely cite the people that are smarter than me and their research and so forth. So this is a nice blog that Jake put together. So this is a really nice way to understand it. The favorable MJO convergence down at the surface, air coming together, rises and it's able to spread out. That's a favorable MJO pattern. Then on the opposite sides you get the downward motion sinking in the atmosphere, the air is diverging at the surface, and you don't have the air lifting as much, and it's much harder to get tropical development. That is what a favorable MJO looks like on a large scale. And, and you see what I'm talking about. Look at the, you know, there's Australia in this diagram. New Zealand over here. Hey, Ben Noel, how you doing? And there's Japan. You get the idea? So this is what it would look like if it was like over the southwest Pacific and that area, uh, east of Ethiopia right there. Uh, and so you'd have a lot of rising motion over the Indian Ocean, sinking motion over the West Pacific. And then this moves from east to west. Or, I'm sorry, west to east. Eastward move it. movement. West to east. I almost had it perfect. Um, and so this moves around the globe, this huge feature. The uh, convectively coupled Kelvin waves, and I know you're getting ready to go, Pah! those are smaller, and we won't even worry about that right now. And the MJO is just this large umbrella, and that's what it looks like, and it's coming. We can see that in these phase diagram charts here. What is that? This explains it pretty well. The phase number highlights the main area of the rising motion, and the large dot is where it is now. An example interpretation, the MGO was in phase five. It moves around. Again, these diagrams are all on this blog that I will link in the, in the discussion of the video today. Uh, all about the MJO. Bottom line is PTC6, soon to be Fred, will be moving into favorable phases and as such it should take advantage of this very warm water and the overall background state and have an opportunity to strengthen. All right. Um, I want to show you a couple things here. Yes, so people were asking me before I let you go, the tracking map that I showed you earlier, those cameras, Several emails like, where can I see those? Those are all part of our crowdfunded Patreon site. That's what we do through Patreon and Hurricane Track Insider. We tie all that together. We use the funding to make all of this possible. So yes, it is technically a paywall. But if you think about it like that, that's very negative. You need to think about it as a cooperative. All these different people working together. In fact, the person that coded the map, the map was my idea. I'm sort of the producer providing the background, like what do we want to do, what do we want to produce, and one of our patrons, Will Woodgate from over in the UK, 
actually put it together. We have a lot of other people to help out. It's a big team, and that's how you become a part of the team. Your funding helps to make all of this possible, and that's where you can access the map through our Hurricane Track Insider site, which is right here. And this is what our cams look like. You've seen this before, I'm sure. We've got our digital dashboard. When stuff is active, it's pretty cool. Yeah, so that's how we do it. And the interactive tracking map is available. That's what it looks like. The cams are on there. You can click on them. And, you know, for example, this is one from Jeff, one of our longtime supporters down in Bradenton. These are our permanent cameras. Look at that big old lush or luscious vegetation in his backyard. Uh, up on the Outer Banks, Rodanthe, you name it, we got them all over the place. Well, at least we're growing. That's not bad, is it? All those are crowdfunded cams, including way out in the desert southwest. The power of what we do with our crowdfunding. Come on, pop up so I don't leave, leave me hanging. There it almost is. Let's just forget it. I'm out. Sometimes those Nest Cams take a few extra seconds. Billions of them around the world, I would imagine, but it works pretty well overall. And it's all crowdfunded through Patreon if you want to get involved. I'll put the link. In fact, that link's always there. <sighs> a lot to have covered, a lot going on. So, bottom line, you say, well, what about Florida? What should I be thinking of? Well, just watch it. I told you some of the clues to watch for. The background state looks favorable. Really don't have much to track right now in terms of a definable low-level center. And until then, the models are just not going to be very helpful. And it's going to lead to a lot of anxiety and a lot of people posting extreme outliers of the worst case scenario here and there. You know, seriously, it's not time to do that yet because it's still just a potential tropical cyclone. We're not even there yet. It's not even made it to Fred. So I can't get any more real and honest with you than that. Keep an eye on it together. See what happens. There's plenty of time to watch and prepare if we need to. First up, of course, it's impacting the Caribbean. It'll do so continuing through the next day or so. And then we'll deal with it in the southeast Bahamas and points north and west from there. All right, that's my game plan anyway. Uh, make of it what you will. As always, thanks for tuning in. I appreciate you giving me your time and attention. Remember, we are on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Of course, you're watching on YouTube. That is Hurricane Track. You see the logo there. Easy to spot. You know it's us. Like, subscribe, share, tell people about what we're doing. Get involved. It's good to have you. You make all of this possible. And without you, no reason for me to be here. So thanks for watching. I am Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com. I'll be back with more for you tomorrow.